जननी शारदांगी रामकृष्ण जगदगुरु पाद पद्मे दृत्वा प्रणमा मुहुर्मु होली मदर शारदा देवी एंड रामकृष्ण द वर्ल्ड टीचर द गुरु ऑफ द वर्ल्ड रिमेम्बरिंग देयर फीट आई बाउ डाउन टू देम अगेन एंड अगेन फ्रेंड्स द सब्जेक्ट फॉर दिस इवनिंग is the role of the holy mother sharada devi in the ram krishna movement it is very strange that among the great religious leaders of the world who are considered as world teachers or in india as we call them incarnations of god among them you will find practically no instance where their holy consort had to play a role in the movement started by them the great religious movements practically there is no other example while in the case of the ramakrishna movement the religious movement initiated by ramakrishna we find this strange exception holy mother never thought by herself that she was to give any contribution towards the religious movement initiated by her husband whom she looked upon as guru as god incarnate as everything that is precious now that is how sri ramakrishna was definitely known among the outside world more as a great religious leader but ramakrishna's contribution does not exhaustively depict the movement of the order which is known by his name but which is actually the movement started by the twin personalities of ramakrishna and holy mother in the beginning as i told you holy mother was very shy she would not even personally appear before her own devotees she used to keep herself keep herself hidden in a veil and even when her devotees wanted spiritual instructions from her she used to speak to them in such a low voice that it was almost inaudible so there is to be two companions 
women devotees of Sri Ramakrishna who used to keep company with the Holy Mother. They used to relay what Holy Mother replied to the questions of the devotees. She was so very shy and always keeping herself away from the public. But in the beginning what happened, Ramakrishna knew what part Holy Mother has to take in the movement. And he was preparing her to take up that role, which was not easy. Much persuasion was required in the beginning. When towards the latter part of the life of Ramakrishna, he told Holy Mother that you will have to take active part in the spread of the message that has the new religion that has been initiated by the Divine Mother through me. Sri Ramakrishna never mentioned himself as the originator. He used to say, Holy Mother is just creating this movement and she is making me her instrument. That is what Sri Ramakrishna looked upon himself to be. Now Holy Mother said, what can I do? I am mere uneducated woman. In those days, in India particularly, women folk were not supposed to be active in any public activity. They always looked after the domestic side and men used to just do all the public activities in those days. So, of course, things have changed to a great extent now. Holy Mother, just like the old type woman, she would, she said, I am a woman, what can I do? Ramakrishna said, no, that will not do. You will have to shake off your shyness and come forward to help me in the movement. That is Ramakrishna's persuasion from the beginning. As for the relation between Ramakrishna and his holy consort mother, you will be surprised to, I mean those who are not fully aware of the relation, they will be surprised to know that Sri Ramakrishna looked upon the Holy Mother as a representation of the Mother Divine, as the supreme incarnation of God. And what Holy Mother looked upon Sri Ramakrishna as the representation of God and Guru and everything. Sometimes she would look upon Ramakrishna as Mother Kali, Divine Mother, Mother Kali. Once Holy Mother was seated near Ramakrishna and she was just shampooing his feet and then asked, What do you think about me? How do you look upon me? Ramakrishna replied, The Divine Mother is in the, who is worshipped in the temple, 
the mother who gave birth to me, who is residing in the concert room, there was a room in the temple, and the mother who is now shampooing my feet, I look upon them all as one. There is absolutely no difference in my view between all these three. The same Divine Mother is everywhere. And Sri Ramakrishna did not mention this merely to please Holy Mother, but he wanted Holy Mother to take that role consciously and actively. Now that is how the relation has to be looked upon. Both of them looked upon each other as incarnations of God. Incarnation of God as Holy Mother looked upon Sri Ramakrishna and Sri Ramakrishna looked upon Holy Mother as a representation of the Mother Divine. Now that was the relation. But as I told you, when Sri Ramakrishna wanted her to be established in that role, he was preparing herself for that. And at the end of her period, at the end of Sri Ramakrishna's period of sadhana, ultimately what he did, he actually worshipped the Holy Mother as Mother Divine. And Holy Mother, in spite of all her shyness, that day became absorbed in ecstasy so much that she never felt any kind of shyness at the time when her husband, whom she respected so much, did worship her as the embodiment of the Divine Mother. What was the purpose behind it? We, nobody at that time knew that there was a big meaning in that. Sri Ramakrishna wanted that Holy Mother be a representation of the Divine Mother, whose role will be for enlightening the dark, ignorant world and to play the most prominent part in the spread of the organization. That is how Sri Ramakrishna was preparing her to be. And from the very beginning, Sri Ramakrishna taught him like that, taught her like that, from the beginning. He taught her the various mysteries of the spiritual experiences, the mysteries of the spiritual world. He taught her how to recognize the different forms of ecstasies that Sri Ramakrishna demonstrated through his experience and thereby Holy Mother became conversant with all these states so that she could effectively diagnose the progress of other people who would come to take resort to him, her, how to teach them as to the different ways that the spiritual life required to be guided by such a great personality. 
Now that is how the mother was treated from the very beginning. Though mother was at that time no, not conscious about it, after the passing away, the story goes that Sri Ramakrishna appeared before her and told her to just step into this active role for the spread of light of religion in the world. That is how the progress started step by step and gradually Holy Mother became convinced about the role she had to play. Sri Ramakrishna treated her with that much of respect. It was not merely a husband looking after, looking upon the wife as a life's partner, not merely as somebody to be taught about the mysteries of the world. But she knew, but Ramakrishna knew that Holy Mother's life was meant for the revelation of the great religious truths to the world. He lovingly used to mention that she is Goddess Saraswati, the Goddess of Learning. She has been born to spread light among the world. Now that was his way of looking at Holy Mother. And Holy Mother gradually understood that she had to take up the responsibility. That was as a sacred trust from her husband. But at the, in the beginning, she was so self-abnegating. She was like Sri Ramakrishna, who always effaced his ego. Similarly, Holy Mother did the same thing. She always hid herself under the veil, as it were. When the organization started, Holy Mother remained in the background, never coming in the forefront. But when there was no organization as a monastic organization as such was not established at the time, there was no money for the disciples to maintain themselves no backing from anywhere. They mostly went about as mendicants, wandering monks. They spent Holy Mother. He, she prayed to the to Sri Ramakrishna. Said, Master, he used to call her as in Bengali he called Thakur. You may translate it as Master. Master, your life you lived for the regeneration of mankind, but your disciples, the band of workers that were expected to spread your message, they are not yet organized. They have no food, no shelter. There is a sort of wandering life that they have taken to, then how your movement will be established and carried on? Did you take all the trouble to come to this world only for this, that after you there will be no continuity of the movement? Oh, Master, let there be some provision for these young men, 
so that they can live together, they can just establish a, a monastery, live together, and thus prepare the life of the organization so that it will continue through many, many years. It is not this way that your movement will come to an end. It is destined to play a role in the regeneration of not only India but the world. That was her fixed belief at that time, and she prayed for the material, at least material comfort to some extent, for the disciples whom she looked upon as her children and as the instruments through which Ramakrishna movement will be continued and spread. That was Holy Mother's prayer. Our direct disciples used to mention that it is Holy Mother's prayer that ultimately brought us together as an organization and food and shelter, the various necessities of life, came to be gradually available to us. Without Holy Mother there would be no organization. There would be individual monks moving about but no organized work could be possible without that. So that is how Holy Mother was the originators of the organization in a way. Just Ramakrishna's movement continued and got stability and spread further because of Holy Mother's prayers to Ramakrishna. Then the organization was there. I mentioned here casually before that Holy Mother did not directly interfere in the administration of the organization. She always kept her in the background. But even then, everybody knew that she was careful about the well-being of the organization. She was very attentive about that. And whenever there was anything to be needed to ch just guide the young disciples, she never failed from doing that duty. She was always there available for that. And her word was the final thing in the matter of administration to the disciples of Sri Ramakrishna, that we have seen. Swami Vivekananda once mentioned addressing his brother disciples. Brothers, you have not yet realized what great power has appeared as the Holy Mother. You have not yet been able to fully understand that. It will take time. But know for certain that Holy Mother is going to play a wonderful role in the regeneration of this country as well as elsewhere. Now that was the great faith that Swamiji had for Holy Mother and that not only Swamiji, Swami Vivekananda, but every disciple of Sri Ramakrishna looked upon her as such, as an earthly represent, representation of Thakur, him, Sri Ramakrishna himself. That was how his Holy Mother was looked upon. But what about her own life? She was not used to live like a, like a having a monastic life. No. She was surrounded with her uh, household relations, her brothers, their brothers' families, and in spite of that, how aloof she remained about the affairs of the household work. He 
was full of the spirit of service always. He did whatever was necessary for the family. But her family was not restricted to the relations in whom, among whom she was born, but the whole world she looked upon as her family, as her children. It's a wonderful outlook that she had. She welcomed the, the Western disciples of Swamiji and particularly Sister Nivedita and others as her own children, as her own daughters. And they also felt in, his, in her presence like that. Sister Nivedita would sit at her feet and often uh, she was so lovingly treated that she never felt that she did not have mother's love from Holy Mother. Nobody felt that way. Everywhere, her eyes were always equally merciful towards everybody. There was no difference to, in her views between even a saint and a sinner. Swami Sharadananda, who was taking all care of her particularly, and once she, Mother remarked that between Sharadananda and one Amjad, one dacoit, he said, there is no difference for me because they are both my children. Whether a man is good or bad, that did not make any difference to her. She once mentioned when somebody complained that there are people who are uh, not considered to be religious type of people. They were even with uh, behavior that is not recommended by so society is the people complain that, Mother, don't allow these people to come to you because then our organization will be looked upon as something undesirable organization, giving, prefer giving the freedom to all these people to come and mix with you. Mother said this, my boy, you do not remember, do not forget that they are my children. My children, they may be, say, soiled with dirt and dust. What is my duty as mother? Not to shun them, but to cleanse them and then take them in my arms. That is my mother's duty. I cannot look upon look down upon them simply because they are sinners. I have to do my bit to, as far as I can, to free, make them cleansed in spirit and take them in my arms. That is my mother's duty. Everyone would feel that way in the presence of the mother, a sort of affection that is unforgettable. Everyone had that feeling. Similarly, when there was some discussion about some people not traveling the right path, they should be reprimanded. Mother said, just as her final counsel, final advice to his disciples, do not look at the faults of others. Try to, if you have got to be fault-finding, find your own faults. Do not look at anybody with a critical eye because that will disturb your peace. And moreover, whom you look down upon, 
that influence will spoil you. So never condemn anybody. Always look with forbearance upon people who do not behave in a manner that is acceptable to everybody. Have patience, have love, and your love will transform them. As Swami Avedananda in one of his uh, hymns composed to Holy Mother, he said, Snehena Vadnasi Manosmadiyan Dosan Asheshan Saguni Karoshi. You have combined us at your, you have bound us at your feet with your affection, and our defects you have transformed into our good traits, good attributes. That is the influence of the Holy Mother. She could change others through her love. It was not by just scolding or looking down upon anybody, but always looking down with love. As I mentioned, I do not remember whether here or elsewhere, one boy was scolded by Swami Shivananda was the head of the monastery and turned him out because of some fault. That young brahmachari went straight to the Holy Mother and told her that he has been turned out from the mud. He was very sorry, in a very depressed mood. Holy Mother said, that's all right, you come and have your meal and take rest. Afterwards, I shall talk to you. As Mother did like that. Then after feeding him, and after he had rested, she told him, I am writing a letter to Tarok, that is Swami Shivananda was called. You just take that letter to her, to him. So he carried that letter of Holy Mother to Swami Shivananda Maharaj. Swami Shivananda read the letter and with a smile said, Clever boy, you have gone straight to the high court and appealed against uh, my judgment, all right. That will prevail, no doubt. So that way he was forgiven. Everywhere it was like that. Nobody was there to feel that Holy Mother has rejected him. Nobody. He would not, she would not reject anybody. Always everybody could be sure of protection and love and affection from he, her as from any loving mother, perhaps much more than that. Others would get tired, but she would not. Once it so happened that a relation of Holy Mother some elderly lady uh, just once uh, said that our Sarada is very unlucky to be married to Ramakrishna so that there is none to call her as mother. Ramakrishna replied, don't worry, she will be called by as mother by so many that she will have no respite, there will be no end to it. She will be troubled by that calling of Mother eh, from all directions. Of course, the Ramakrishna's statement was true, partly. Throughout the, the world, perhaps, her children are calling her Mother, Mother, but she was not troubled with that. Her patience her love, her forbearance was unending. That was the life of Holy Mother. She lived with many worldly relations, as I told you. But in spite of that, she never forgot to keep a difference between the monks and the other householders, because their lives are different. Their ways should be different to some extent, 
But then that did not mean that any of them will be deprived of our affection. That was Holy Mother's way. Uh, <coughs> looking upon the pe- upon all different classes of people, Mother was Mother to everybody in all respects. She used to say, "I am all. I am your Mother." not merely as a sort of assumed relationship. This relationship is forever, abiding. Once somebody said, Mother, we are not realizing how far we are progressing in spiritual life. Holy Mother said, don't worry. Suppose a person is asleep, and he is carried from one place to another, and when he wakes up, he finds he is in a different place. Does that mean that uh, it cannot happen? You may not be aware of your progress, but you rest assured that your mother is there for your protection, and he will be carried to the towards the goal without any say doubt about it. Rest assured when says when you are very much depressed, remember that you have got a mother and trust on me I shall be always uh, protecting you under all circumstances. That give, gave immense faith and solace to all who believed in her. Throughout her period, her life, it was like that. When she was approached by devotees at times without any consideration, they would come to her and she would not mind herself cooking for them at all hours and feed them. When she was doing a lot of work herself like that, somebody said, Mother, why are you so much uh, disturbed by these activities? Your disciples can afford to keep some helping hands, so why don't you take advantage of that? Holy Mother said, you see, it is my duty as mother to attend to the comforts of my my children. So I am not happy unless I do it myself. That was the mother's outlook. Somebody, always it happened, some disciple wanted that unless mother feeds me, I won't take food. So mother is there to feed. It's like that all demands were met, and that without any kind of uh, annoyance or any kind of feeling of uh, uneasiness, always with affection, with love. Now, her whole life depended upon, was a type that should be emulated by the other people, particularly the women folk, how they are to be serviceable, how they are to be forbearing, how they are to be affectionate towards the world, irrespective of what return they give, return or no return. Love should be unconditional. That was Mother's way of looking at the conduct of people. In Holy Mother, disciples found that she would not make any difference, particularly among the women disciples. He never took the exalted position of a guru for them. She just treated them as their as her own children, own daughters. It so happened that some disciple came and paid so much respect always with affect so much respect, but Mother would ask her to lie down on the same cot by her side 
just as mother and daughter sleep together sometimes. I do not know the conditions here, but in India it is like that. So that was the relation that Holy Mother used to uh, feel and used to behave with everywhere in all her uh, conduct with the others. She, when people went to ask her questions, serious questions, she would give such simple answers to that, that at once the question, the problem will be solved. And without any kind of scholarship being needed thereby, she did not uh, study practically unlettered. She started reading just the first lessons primary, but then that the family did not approve of that. In those days, they were very superstitious about giving education to women. So they did not allow that. And Holy Mother remained almost unlettered. She could not even sign her name. Just little she could read, but not much, and even could not write at all. That was her education. But what a store of knowledge. As Sri Ramakrishna did not say for nothing that she was the embodiment of the goddess of learning. Really it was learning, it was wisdom, without being clothed with the high-sounding words, simple utterances were enough to solve the problems of the whole world. That, were, that was Holy Mother. Never looked upon anybody with any other relation than the, as, her, as their mother. No, that is why motherhood is most important. It comes so natural. What happened, you know, in the beginning, because mother was so shy, even we monks would not have the opportunity of uh, closely coming in contact with her. She used to keep that distance always, except in the case of a few disciples who were always with her. Others was always kept at a distance, but they never failed to taste the love that Mother bears for all of them, in spite of the distance that she kept. And in her daily life, she showed how one should live. Early in the morning, very early in the morning, she would rise. During her stay at the temple of Dakshineshwar, she used to live in a small room, unthinkably small room, where uh, it is a wonder how she could live there. And early morning, very early morning, say at night, three o'clock or so, she would finish her bath in the river and then sit for meditation for long hours and at daybreak she would just start her work for the service of Ramakrishna, cooking food for him as well as for the disciples who used to be with him and working this way for the whole day. And again in the afternoon she would sit for meditation, continue late in the afternoon, in the evening, and then again cooking for the devotees. And there are some devotees, women devotees, who used to stay sometimes with her, as desired by Ramakrishna who also had to be looked upon by the Holy Mother. Her, dis her austerities were famous for all people. Severe, very austere life it was. 
self-abnegating, never enjoying any kind of comfort, never allowing herself a little amenities of life. She lived in the, the, that concert room at Dakshineshwar, and nobody knew that she was there. The manager of the temple was asked once, does Holy Mother stay here? He replied, we hear that she is living here, but we don't, I have never seen her. Never seen her, though living together in the same compound. That was Holy Mother's shyness. Now when graduate, among us monastic members, we used to keep her also secluded like that. Her photos, when after the passing away of the Master, when Holy Mother had many disciples for herself, even then her photos were not sold to outside people. Even disciples could find it with great difficulty. No circulation was made of the pictures of the Holy Mother. We thought she was just like our mother, who has to be kept hidden. But as I told you during the centenary celebration of the Holy Mother, there was such a worldwide celebration at that time that in one occasion in a memorial meeting I said, we tried to keep Holy Mother hidden, but she has at last unveiled herself. So she became known throughout the world at that time, and known so intimately that it is a wonder to us also how it could happen like that. I tell you one instance. In, a, in South India, in a shop, there was a big picture of Holy Mother. So one of our Swamis who happened to go to that side, as he, he saw the picture of Holy Mother, he was surprised. How could the picture be here? Then he came and asked the owner of the shop, whose picture is it? He said, we don't know. Then why have we kept it here? We kept it because it is an auspicious thing. If she is there, we feel protected. That was unknown person, but how mother protects them, even unknown people. That is how she is spreading herself, we say. And it is a wonder that sometimes people find in the presence of Holy Mother, Holy Mother is more reassuring, more affectionate even than Sri Ramakrishna. Because Sri Ramakrishna would sometimes, they say, one of the disciples said, Sri Ramakrishna would sometimes uh, just test a person and then accept him as a disciple. Holy Mother never tested anybody. Whoever came was accepted immediately. And one instance is there of her great love for the people who came to her. One day, Sri Ramakrishna, when he was, he was living in Dakshineshwar, Holy Mother was in the temple, in that concert room, I told you, but she could not meet Sri Ramakrishna more than twice while she carried food to Sri Ramakrishna at noon and in the evening, at lunch time and at dinner time. One day, one of the devotees came and prayed to Holy Mother, Mother, I like to carry the food to Sri Ramakrishna. So Mother could not go then. She handed the food to the devotee to carry to the Master. Sri Ramakrishna had that uncanny insight. She tried to take the food but could not take it. She t made several uh, efforts, but could not touch their food. The, the Holy Mother was reported that thing. Then Holy Mother came 
and with folded hands prayed to the master, Please take this. Tomorrow I shall cook. And the cooking she did, but tomorrow I shall bring the food. Said, No, the food is contaminated. I cannot take it. All right, I shall cook fresh and then offer you. No, you say that you will not send my food through anybody and everybody. Holy Mother said, with folded hands, Thakur, I cannot give you my word that way. If anybody comes to me calling me Mother and asks for the favor of bringing food to you, I cannot deny her that. So that was Holy Mother when he disobeyed his master, Sri Ramakrishna also. Sometimes it happened like that. But Master was not annoyed. That is what he was preparing the Holy Mother to be, all-loving ideal of motherhood. And that's what kind of mother, not only one who would look after the physical nourishment of the child, but his spiritual nourishment also. And he was always aware of that. So many people had used to come to her for spiritual upliftment, for counsel, for comfort, and they would find everything readily from the affectionate mother. From her early days, she was, when she was a little girl, even from that time she was so serviceable that in the poor family she used to look upon all the other members when her father had already passed away. The mother had to be helped in a hard life it was. They had to work physically for procuring food for the family. And the mother was there always with untiring zeal she would just help the people. I, we know of many instances in that life which will be ordinarily, uh, un, ordinarily which will not be understood. They are sometimes miraculous. We don't min mention miracles, so I omit those portions. But miracles did happen, a lot of them, in her life as well. But more than that, the real life that people can understand, the real life that can set an example as to how to live the life of a spiritual person, in a, absorbent, absorbed in God, and yet attending to the duties of the world. Holy Mother was the living example for that. That is why he, she was more approachable, more understood than Sri Ramakrishna, who was so very far away from ordinary human beings that they could not reach him. But Holy Mother was easily reachable, easily approachable. He, she never behaved in such a way as to show any difference, as I told you in the beginning. So they got comfort and at, his, at her feet, and always they found nourishment spiritually from her, without ever making any show about it. Holy Mother did that. That is why her influence is so irresistible, so commonly at, appreciated by all people. Now that is the Holy Mother's life in nutshell. I did not go into the details of our life with the idea that you are supposed to read from the books. They are in English also, so you can find from the books Mother's great life that is appealing to everybody. 
and that will definitely elevate person spiritually. What is ne- needed is simple faith and yearning for God realization, and mother is there to help him or her as they need in their own way, without, as Sri Ramakrishna said, don't impose yourself on anybody. Mother also never did that. She was self-abnegating, and yet she was such a towering personality in spiritual life that everybody got, got protection and solace from her. I have not given many facts uh, which will be had from books, but I try to give my impression about the Holy Mother, my impression and the impression that we all have among the members of the monastic order, as well as householders who have come in touch with her. May her blessings be on all of you. problems in life, we tend to forget that spiritual life should be joyful, and we tend to feel the need for fresh inspiration, and really this is what you brought to us during your visit to us, is joyfulness and inspiration, and we'll all miss you very much when you leave. That joyfulness, I think, was only dampened by the fact that you do have to leave tomorrow, (laughs) and also by the fact that Swami Swahanandaji has missed this opportunity to which he had so been looking forward. And so we all feel, as he does, the, the sadness of his not being with you during his visit. And we hope next time that you come that all will go well and you will be hail and hearty. And we do hope you come <coughs> again, Maharaj, as this is your home. And we wish you a very joyful, travel in this country, country and also in the travel abroad. Maharaj will be leaving tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. He'll be flying out from LAX at 9.50 for Sacramento. And from Sacramento, he'll go to San Francisco and Berkeley, and then to Portland, to Seattle, and to St. Louis, Chicago, New York, Boston, Toronto, London, Singapore, and then finally back to India uh, to reach, I believe, on October 18th, Ashtami Day of Durga Puja. So it's a very long and grueling trip, and uh, I'm sure that Maharaj will bring that joy and inspiration to others as he has done to us. And I also want to mention that the Labor Day retreat will be held September 5th on Monday, from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. And there will be a reading of the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. So those of you who come are kindly requested to bring your copy of the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna because we'll read, we'll read the entire Gospel from cover to cover. So we ask you please to bring your copy of the Gospel. So Maharaj, we wish you a very happy journey and please come to see us again. Now, though my talk is over, I have to say a few words. First of all, I am also very sorry that Swami Swahananda fell ill. But uh, today I went to see him and found him quite cheerful and speedily recovering. I am thankful to God that his recovery has been very quick and hope within a few days he will be all right. And th- secondly, my visit to this place, I knew it would be very short time. I cannot help it. But 
it has fulfilled my cherished dream. I wanted to see the centers, and by centers I mean not the place, not the house, not and things like that. I mean the swamis and the devotees who are the life and soul of the center. So I wanted to meet them. Uh, that is why I have come. I have come as a pilgrim and I have gone through the areas as a pilgrim. I do not know whether it will be uh, possible for me to come again. I am also in advanced stage. But Sri Ramakrishna can make impossible things also happen. <laughs> so we rest upon him for whatever is in the future. But tell you that I shall carry a very happy memory of these meetings. And I shall mention the people they are in India. They don't think you are the devotees only. The devotees are there everywhere. And I have found kindred souls everywhere, which makes me extremely happy. Wherever I go, I feel I am in a very familiar company, though I am meeting them for the first time. So thank you very much for giving me that kind of pleasure.